So the format mm-hmm. over here is, we're calling it Chok 2020. What is Chok 2020? In theory, I came up with the concept in the year 2020, but in, I don't think they have it in Ashkenazi world. In the Sephardi world, there's a book called Chok Li Yisrael. And Chok Li Yisrael is broken up by parasha and by day. And each day, there is a little bit of Chumash and a little bit of Halakha and a little bit of Kabbalah, mm-hmm. and a little bit of Navi, and a little bit of Mishnayot, and a little bit of Musar. And the idea is you need to be a well-rounded Jew. Mm-hmm. And you can't just know any one subject. You need to know everything. And that's why every day you learn a little bit of everything. So I figured Chok 2020, the concept was, it won't be a full hour, but in theory, 20 minutes of Halakha, which it won't be 20 minutes, but and 20 minutes of, let's say, something on the parasha, and then 20 minutes of Musar, or something Kabbalistic, or something now we have coming up like Ba'omer, etc., so that would be more or less the format. If we said we're going to have a class on halacha, none of you would be here. Right? But if we're going to have a class, yeah, so a little bit of everything is, is nice. So there's a book uh, called Yakut Yosef. That's based on the halachot of Chacham Ovadia. His son, the current chief rabbi, wrote it. And this specific one is called Otzer Dinim Isha Lebat. These are the laws specifically for the women. Obviously, many of the halachot overlap, but especially for the women. So we'll go through some halachot. A woman gets up in the morning, don't jump out of bed. Don't be, and I saw a study recently, they said the same thing, don't jump out of bed right away. Take at least six or seven seconds before you get up. Right. Women say, It takes about six, seven seconds. So, <laughs> first thing you do when you, don't, don't jump out of bed. But the first thing, he's giving you medical advice. Don't jump out of bed, it's not good, the blood rushes. Take a few seconds, sit up. Sitting up is different than jumping out. Sit up, and before you actually stand up. It says, and then, as we just mentioned, what do you say? You say, Moda ani fanecha. Thank you, Hashem. Ashkenazim also say, Moda, or they say, Modeh. Oh, Ashkenazim say, Moda ani fanecha. Modeh, even the women say, Modeh. It's interesting, because there's a few different uh, brachot that, let's say, I think the Sfaradim, they don't say, Shalom Asani Avid. What do they say? Instead of saying Shlosani Goy, they say Shlosani Goya, which grammatically obviously makes sense. Ashkenazim, I think the women keep it the same, which makes I don't I don't I don't, I don't know why, but it obviously makes more sense to say Shivcha and Goya. But okay, but then all women say Shasani Kritzono. That's not, it's not different by Sfaradim Ashkenazim. But over here also, from a grammatic perspective, Moda Moda ni defanecha. Um, Right? And it says it's important that the women also train the children, the boys, the girls, to wake up and say, Modani de Fanecha. It's not just something that men need to do, women also need to do. And he says, when you say, Modani de Fanecha, Mele Chayde Kayam, Shechezad Dabi Nishvati Bechemla, there's a little bit of a pause by Chemla between Rabbah and Munatecha. Some people say, Modani de Fanecha, Mele Chayde Kayam, Shechezad Dabi Nishvati Bechemla, Rabbah, and Munatecha. Now, the Rabbah. Rabba means abundance. Emunatecha, how abundant is the emunah? I'll just give you a quick Torah Torah, because you're saying it every morning. What exactly are you saying? We talk about emunatecha. What is emunatecha? What's the emunatecha? What are we referring to over here? How abundant is the emunah? Faith of our faith in Hashem. That's what I would have thought. That's not what the words mean. Oh, modani de fanecha. Thank you, Hashem. Melechai Vekayam, king who's in charge. Shechazar Tabi Nishmati, you gave me back my Neshama, Rabba Emunatecha. How abundant is your Emunah in me? I give the example to teenagers. Nobody here has teenagers, right? No. Okay. Ezat Hashem, you'll have teenagers. And you feel like, <laughs> you feel like the child's eight going on 18, right? Baruch Hashem. Rabba Emunatecha, what happens? Uh, we'll use me as an example, right? So my son's 16. And next year he's going to learn to drive. I'll, I'll let you know when he's on the road. You can, you, can, you can make sure to stay home. And let's say, chas v'shalom, first day he comes back and there's a big scratch. Obviously he's not getting a very good car. But, all right, there's a scratch on the car. What am I going to say to him? Am I going to let him drive again? She's like hardcore Sephardi. No. One scratch, you're out. You're done. Never again, right? It's okay. They're learning. You have to be more careful. Next day he comes back and, and the mirror is missing. Now already, you're going to be paying for this yourself. The next day he comes back and the whole bumper is off. Eventually what happens? 
Aspik var, Habibi. I'm not letting you drive every time you crash the car. Every time there's something else. Hashem says, Moshe Levi, I'm going to take you in Neshama when you're sleeping. And what does he do? He polishes it up. He makes sure it's nice, good as new, and gives it back. Next day, Levi messes it up again. Hashem takes it, polishes it up, good as new. It's been 39, almost 40 years. And every single day, Hashem says, Levi, here's your neshama. I'm brand spanking new, beautiful, clean, pure. And every single day, I mess it up. Rabba emunatecha. How abundant is Hashem's emuna in us? That no matter how many times we do what we shouldn't be doing, and we're human beings. Hashem doesn't say, sorry, Habibi, no more. I'm not giving you the car anymore. Hashem says, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm giving you another chance, another chance. Rabba emunatecha. Right? That's the first thing we say, thank you to Hashem. And it's also, if we think about what we're saying, it's good for us that every day we say, you know, Hashem believes in me, I need to believe in myself. It says, even before you do Nitilat Yadayim, you're able to say, Modani. Some people think, oh, I'm impure, my hands are impure. No, it's not a problem. You're able to say, Modani the Fanecha, before you even do Nitilat Yadayim. If you have a child that's old enough, then the, the parents should teach them to do Nitilat Yadayim. Obviously, there's a concept of Higiyah Lechinuch where a child reaches the age of chinuch, which is probably six, seven years old. But even if, he says, there's no reason not to teach a child when they're one or two or three, that you wake up in the morning, and you do nitilat yadayim. Most kids get confused between nitilat yadayim of the morning and nitilat yadayim of eating challah and eating bread, that they'll just do one, two, three, one, two, three, as opposed to alternate, or even they'll just alternate, not realize that nitilat yadayim for the food, you only need to do one, two, three, one, two, three. Um... If you have a woman, women are only obligated to daven once a day. You daven three times a day. That's pretty epic. Once you have kids, that becomes nearly impossible. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't have to necessarily be shachrit. It shouldn't be arvit or marv. It should either be shachrit or mencha. So a woman who's going to be praying shachrit, she should make sure that she washes her hands before she does other things, and especially before she davens. Do nitilat yadayim. You don't halachically have to do nitilat yadayim before you get dressed. Right? Not this week, but maybe... We'll get to the discussion of doing the tilat yadayim before you touch food. And if you touch food, is it tamay? You have to rewash the food. An apple you can rewash, right? But a loaf of bread, not necessarily. So there's only like a certain amount of steps that you're supposed to take before you wash the glass. So you're able, there's no, I don't know about that. Probably maybe this, that's Kabbalistic or whatever it is. But it's not a halachic problem that you touched your clothes, your hands were impure. No, no, no. You're saying it's not a problem. I just know that there's like a how many Take. It could be, that's the ideal, but it's not that if you didn't do that, you're impure and you can't and whatever it might be. Yeah. So he says some people, they're very makbi, that they put the, the basin with the water next to their bed. Beautiful, that's tabol and bracha, that's already kabbalistic. That's based on the arizal, but that's not necessarily a must. Right. Um, does a woman need to take off her rings when she does nitilat yadayim? Right. So it's not the same as going to the mikvah, and it's also not the same as eating Chala, it's not a problem to have your rings on your hands, not considered a chasitza. I remember when I was in Kolel, so the, we were discussing the halachot of Nida. And every guy in Kolel gave a little chabur, or gave a little shir. So it was my turn, and I was discussing um, chasitza. And I said, and by the way, by Netilat Yadayim for a woman, it's not a problem to be wearing nail polish, right? Or when they do Netilat Yadayim in the morning, you could have the rings on. They do Netilat Yadayim for Hamotzi, you take off your rings. I heard a story one time from Rabbi Foreman. He said that there was a girl who had never, never experienced Shabbat before. And I think she was in seminary and she went with a bunch of girls in seminary to, uh, to someone's house. And she knows nothing and they sing Shalom Aleichem and it's beautiful. And they sing Eshet Chayel and it's magnificent. And then everyone goes to wash their hands. And she's watching, she's towards the back of the, of the queue. Everyone's washing their hands. And what do most girls do when they have rings? Where do they put their hands as they wash them? They put them in their mouth. Right? And she's getting more and more nervous and she's getting towards the front. And she says to her friend, yeah, she says to her friend, she looks back and she says to her friend, she's like, I don't know what to do. She's like, what do you mean? She's like, I don't have any rings to put in my mouth. <laughs> she thought that was part of the ritual. <laughs> what do you do before you tell your daim? You take a ring, you put it in your mouth. Like, <laughs> right? But for the tell your daim in the morning, it's not a problem. Just to finish off the story, I was giving a shiur about chatzitza. So to wear nail polish for mikvah is, is problematic. To wear nail polish, especially nowadays with the gel and all that, and it's perfect for Nitila Yadayim, it's not a problem. I said, for men, it would be considered a chatzitza. Unless you're a painter or a mechanic where your hands are always dirty and that's part of the norm, it's a chatzitza. And one guy says to me, one second, I'm from LA. Most men get manicures with clear polish. I'm like, seriously? 
<laughs> this, also, this was I'm in London now, twelve years. This is like fifteen years ago. I'm like, if it's the norm, I was discussing how if it's the norm, then then it's not a problem. It's not considered begadi or in general over here in Akhazah because the guy wants it there and it's the norm. And he was saying in LA that's the norm. I'm like, really? He's like, yeah. I'm like, then then that's then there wouldn't be a problem. Yeah, that's LA. But then halakhically, it wouldn't be a problem if that becomes the norm. Wow. Right. Maybe in LA. <laughs> I was in the barber shop and someone said to me, Is it considered begadisha? Begadisha literally means a man shouldn't wear the clothing of a woman. But it doesn't only mean clothing. Some will say, uh, If a man's dyeing his hair, that's something that women do and men don't do. Or nowadays, maybe it's the norm that most men or many men that are, that are older dye their hair. So the guy said to me, Is it a problem to have the barber trim your eyebrows? Or is that, so I said to the barber, Do most men get their eyebrows trimmed? He said, Yeah, everybody gets their eyebrows trimmed. I said, that, If that's the norm, then it becomes not something that only women do. It's, it depends on the generation and depends on the city, but something I must interesting. Say, I feel like that's a really slippery slope in today's world. <laughs> We're not going to go there, but yes, <laughs> most definitely so. De- definitely, what's considered? I think it would have to be majority, majority, like most, over fifty-one percent. Do they, you know, do they get their eyebrows trimmed or not? Do, you know, when does it come? I don't know. Whatever it might be, hair dye, waxing. I don't know. So yeah, it is becoming a slippery slope. What's considered normal or not? But a woman does not, when it comes to the time of the morning. Woman does not have to, um, she doesn't have to take off her rings to do Nitila Yadayim in the morning. Right? What do you do when you take the cup? Ideally, you take the cup in your right hand and then you pass it over to your left hand. Kabbalistically, it brings down on the bottom over here in the commentary. Uh, the, the rabbis say the right hand, Kabbalistically, is Midat Chesed and the left hand is Midat Hadin. Right? One is more kindness and one is more justice. Right? Soldiers, right? The army is midat adin. Left, 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 right, left. They're boxing, right? Left, give him a jab, jab, and then. But the left is considered midat adin. So when you pick up the cup, ideally, you take it from the right hand, you pass it over to the left hand, and then you wash your right hand first, and then you alternate. If I'm not mistaken, I was looking. I don't know if he says or I just missed it. I think you alternate because when you're half asleep, it makes you <laughs> be more aware. If you're just like, mm. and ideally, you do it three times because again, kabbalistically. If I was to ask you, why is it that you need to do it like a dime in the morning? What would you tell me? To get your hands ruach ra. You're washing your hands. One reason is to get rid of the ruach ra. Another reason is because you're about to go talk to Hashem and you need to be clean and pure. Another reason is because you might have touched places that are meant to be covered. So he says, women aren't necessarily davening shachrit and going to talking to Hashem. So that reason is not always applicable. But you still have this concept of ruach ra, of impurity that might have settled in on you. And you might also might have touched areas that are normally covered, and therefore women need to wash their hands, and you do it alternating. Um, he says, if you don't have a cup, ideally you're supposed to have a cup. This is for the of the morning. It's a little bit different from the tilat yadaim of food, but the tilat yadaim of the morning. If you don't have a cup, you're in the forest, you're hiking, or you know, the kids were having a water fight and they broke all the cups. Maybe it's just my house. I don't know, right? And you don't have any. You don't have any. You don't have the tilat yadaim cup. So you can stick your hand under the, the faucet, but you don't make the bracha, because it's not nitila, which maybe we'll discuss more next week, but it's not I nitila. Put it in a basha, even, like, even for bread. Like, yeah. uh, it's meant to be in a cup. What's the reason behind why it's yeah. meant to be in a cup? Like, uh, I don't know, but I think there's an element of the keli that's machzik. There's a certain kelim that they hold, and it's not just like you're sticking your hands in. Also, back in the day, it's someone they're sticking their hands into the water, it's dirty, it's muddy, it's the ocean, it's salty, whatever it might be. They didn't have running water the same way we do, and the bracha would be different. It wouldn't be on the tilat yadayim. It says, so if you don't have a cup, you still do, still make sure that your hands get clean to take so off the like impurity. One, two, three, yeah, yeah, you but, but you don't see, it wouldn't say bracha. It says, but for kids, from a chinuch perspective, you still teach them to make the bracha just because they don't, really, they're not getting the difference. And you teach them, you wash your hands, you make a bracha. You eat food, you make a bracha. I know in Israel, I ended up coming to London, but like my son was three years old, and he was going for the cheder interview. And someone said to me, he's like, they're going to offer him a sweet only because they want to see he's going to make a bracha. <laughs> so before you go in, tell him. They give you a sweet, like, <laughs> tell him over and over. <laughs> it's a test. The sweet is a test. Right? Um, what's that? When they sit there at the entrance of uh, the Hasno. Also? These are tricks of the trade. I told the boys, when the Rebbe comes and he puts his hand on your shoulder, He's not trying to be nice. He's trying to check if you're wearing TT. <laughs> <laughs> you think he's being nice? Hi, Maishi, what's doing? <laughs> he's, he's testing. Right? These are all... 
little, little things there. I was by a chupa, and a friend of mine was getting married this summer. And I had a guy sitting next to me. I said, you see, you know why they use white wine? Just in case it spills, you don't want to ruin the dress. That's happened many a times, and they had red wine, and you know, devastating for all the pictures, and, right? And I was, I was pointing out like a bunch of little things, like, I never noticed it. Why they do this? Why is it like, if, if you know behind the scenes, you know, what a question. So yeah, you, you do alternating, and like you said, boys, girls, men, women, everybody needs to get the ruach ra, the impurity off their, hand, off their hands. Um, if a woman, if it's her time of the month, that's not a reason that she should or shouldn't do it until yadayim, do it until yadayim. He says, some women, they fill up the cup for their husbands. And they prepare it, even if a woman's in nida, not problematic. He says, interestingly, if a woman is in nida, and the, she's going to open the faucet, and then the husband's going to stick his hands underneath, or stick the cup underneath, that might be problematic. He says, if she uses her left hand, does it, she know it. It's not problematic. Nowadays, I don't think that's very, very applicable or happening too often, but technically, it's just good to, 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 to know. Yeah. Safari women, maybe, you know, the old school. <laughs> Somebody told me that there was a woman, a bunch of like old school Indian women were sitting at a table, and there was one woman, her husband either got divorced or passed away, I think passed away, and she married Ashkenazi. And they were saying, let's say her name was Debbie. They were like, you won't believe it. Debbie, her husband, he makes her a plate. They were like, no. <laughs> he makes her a plate? <laughs> Unheard of, can't be. In the bar cousin. All right, so that's over here the halachot of uh, Nitila Yadayim. And we'll stop here, we'll continue next time. Wait, um, sure. just a question. You, you do make a bracha the first time when you wash when you wake up. So yeah, you yeah. do Nitila Yadayim, 100%. I don't know why recently I had this discussion with my husband and he said, you don't make a bracha the first time when you wash when you wake up. Yeah, you didn't. Why, why no, you, you didn't Nitila Yadayim. He's discussing, um, we'll get to it next week properly, but he's discussing when do you make the bracha. <laughs> Technically, you should make the bracha before you dry your hands. Right, but in the no, oh, so that's what I was gonna say. Quite often nowadays, you're in the bathroom. You can't make a bracha in the bathroom. So if you could go outside and you know make the bracha and then either come back in, well, you might get water everywhere. He, he brings down the chida that says that you have on what to rely if you don't if you dry your hands and then make the bracha afterwards. But in theory, it's better to make the bracha before you dry your hands. Same thing with until yadaim when you're eating bread. You shouldn't dry your hands and then make the bracha. You make the bracha. Say the bracha. Yeah, there's a yeah, there's a concept in brachot in general of over la siyatan. Before you drink, you make the bracha, and then you do it. Before you do hafashat chala, you make the bracha, and then you do that. There's always right. Then you get okay. Maybe we'll get into it eventually. But when it comes to candle lighting and sfaradim and ashkenazim, when do you make the bracha? Yes, no. When did you accept shabbat? When you struck the match? When you made the bracha? After, before? We'll get there. But all brachot pretty much, right? you make the bracha, then you blow the shofar, you make the bracha, then you read the migdah, you make the bracha, then you do the mitzvah. So if you dried your hands and then you make the bracha, technically, you missed it. Because it. it's not over the asiyatan. You did it after you did the mitzvah. Yeah. You can't eat and then say, oh, I forgot a bracha, make a bracha now. So technically, you should make the bracha before you dry your hands. If you don't have a choice, you have on what to rely that it's, 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 it's okay. But ideally, you should make the bracha before you dry your hands. So this week's parasha is anybody know? Very good, Bahar. Baruch Hashem. I remember. I already know from the British lady and that you kept on saying parashas Amar, Amar, Amar. Oh really? Okay. <laughs> See, you knew this is the next one. Okay. I, I remember I was I was giving a shir to a bunch of ladies, and this woman came to me and said, another one of her, my friends stopped covering her hair, and it wasn't about covering her hair. I said, not surprised. She probably has no connection to Judaism. And she was like, whoa, that's like a heavy statement. Like, no. I said, did she go to shul? No. Does she go to classes? She has little kids, not easy. I said, understood. So what's her connection to Judaism? Five-year-old parasha questions? Like, quite often you don't know the parasha. Not because, <laughs> you're busy. And if it's not something that you make time in your schedule to do, then it's very easy to not. So yeah, parasha Bahar. Quite often it's a double parasha. This year it's a leap year, so it's only a singular parasha, parashat bahar. And a big focus of the parasha is on the concept of Shemitah. So it needs its, its own proper class. Shemitah and the elements of Shabbat in seven weeks, as we lead up the same way, the seven cycles of seven of Shemitah till you get to Yovel. And now we have seven weeks getting us to Shavuot. Excuse me, but a different, different, different time. Something interesting that we know when it comes to Shemitah. 
This year in Israel is a Shemitah year. You'll see campaigns that they're raising money for Shemitah, etc. I had a student one time, he was in Tesco or one of these places. And in London, I don't think they have it in America, every single piece of fruit or vegetable, it tells you where it came from. Right? So there was something there, oranges, and it didn't have a list. And it didn't say where it came from. And he knew quite often they got their oranges from Israel. So he went to the, to the guy and he said, excuse me, are these oranges from Israel? And the guy said, no, 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 they're from Chile. And the guy next to him said, you're also BDA? Like, you're, you're also not buying products? It's like, opposite, no. Shnita. <laughs> but <laughs> to be careful, I'm, I lived in Israel. People ask me, how long you live in Israel? I said, I lived in Israel for a year, five times. But every year, maybe one more year. But one of the years was Shmita, And over there, it's just, you have, to, you have to really know the halachot. You have to hold on to it and wait for the peels to rot before you throw them out. Etc. But Baruch Hashem. But one of the elements of Shemitah is that we know you don't touch your field for three years, pretty much. You have six years, and then on the seventh year, Bashana Shvi'it Shemitah, it's the year that you don't touch your land. What happens <clears throat> that year? Everything just sits there and pretty much will grow and then rot. Now, what happens after the seventh year? You need to get rid of all that, and you need to now plant. When is that now going to grow? In year, you plant in year eight, it doesn't grow till pretty much year nine. So you're almost going to be stuck. So the Torah tells us, tishal. And if you're going to ask, said, what are you going to do in the seventh year? <laughs> I'm not going to have enough. Hashem says, don't worry, you'll have enough produce for three years. At the end of year six, you have enough for normal, for year seven, year eight, and year nine. Because you're not going to... And the Chafetz Chaim asks the question. He says, And if you're going to ask, What am I going to do in the next years? Don't worry, Hashem says, You're going to get the bracha, you're going to get enough for three years. Ask the Chafetz Chaim, What if you don't ask? Pasuk says, And if you're going to ask, What am I going to do? What if you don't ask? What if you just say, Hashem said, Don't do it, I won't do it. Says the Chafetz Chaim, Then you don't get three times as much. And the commentaries are perplexed. If you ask what's going to be, you get three times as much. And if you don't ask, you don't get three times as much. How does that make sense? So the Chabetz Chaim said, no, no, no. If you don't ask, you don't get. But that's the ultimate bracha. If somebody says, they're on a high level of emuna, I trust, Hashem said, don't touch your land, but I'm nervous. <laughs> I have bills to pay. I have kids to feed. What am I going to do? Shem says you get three times as much. So what happens at the end of year six? You need to get three times the amount of workers. You need to get three times the amount of silos to store your grain. You need to work triple as hard. You need a year off after that year. Because you worked, you worked so much harder than any other year. What about the guy who doesn't ask? He doesn't get. So he doesn't have to work three times as hard. So how's he going to manage? You have two farmers. Farmer Ruven and Farmer Shivon. Farmer Ruven says, I don't know what's going to be. Hashem, you said you're going to give three times as much. I trust you're going to give three times as much. I'm quite nervous, but I believe in you, Hashem. Hashem gives him three times as much. And he works, he works really hard. And he sees his neighbor, Farmer Shimon. He says, whoo, it's, it's been a rough couple of weeks. And we know that you have it. He says, what do you mean? He says, you didn't get three times as much? No. What are you going to do? I don't know. Hashem said, don't worry about it. I don't worry about it. How are you going to manage? Yeah, Mashiach, I trust Hashem, said it'll be good. That guy normally, Baruch Hashem, has six kids, needs to order two pies of pizza. You'll see, once you have teenagers, no matter how much food you, whatever you put out, they'll eat. That's not a problem. Yeah, you're thinking, oh, each kid will get two slices. You order two pies, they'll eat it. They order three pies, it'll be done. <laughs> it'll be done. All right, teenagers, Baruch Hashem. <laughs> normally, you need to order two pies. Over here, each kid eats two, three slices, and they want chips, and they want sushi. The farmer who says, whatever Hashem wants will be, will be. You know what happens? The guy orders one pie. Each kid has three bites. and like, whew, full. Normally, the guy has to do an MOT every year. It needs new tires, needs new brakes. Normal wear and tear. The guy who trusts, the guy who believes, the guy who said, Hashem said, don't worry. What happens? He doesn't worry. And you know what? Hashem gives him the bracha that not only does he not get, he doesn't get the three times as much because he doesn't need it. Hashem will sort it out. The kids don't get sick. The car doesn't break down. The house doesn't leak. The, the appliances that are old, they seem to manage. I said to my wife, sometimes my cars are at least 15 years old. And sometimes you do the MOT and you, you need to spend five, six, seven hundred pounds. And sometimes, sure, just the MOT, 55 quid, done. 
Hashem loves us. Right? There's different times where different things happen. And this worked out. It's all Hashem. If you trust, Shemitah is the ultimate trust. She agrees. Right? <laughs> Shemitah, the ultimate trust in HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Hashem says, we show Hashem, I know that Hashem, you run the show. When it comes to money, when it comes to business, I put my trust in you, Hashem. And it's going to be what it's going to be. So I'm not going to stress. Right? And that leads us to Lagba Omer, that's in a couple of days. If I was to ask you, we have coming up Lagba Omer, what are we celebrating? What would you tell me? What are we celebrating on Lagba Omer? Vishimon Bar Yochai. What does that mean? What are we celebrating? Rabbi Akiva's 24,000 students stopped dying. And that's what the rabbis tell us. And I always ask one simple question. How many students Rabbi Akiva have? How many died? Woohoo! Let's make a party. Everyone's dead. Let's make a barbecue. <laughs> like, what, what are we celebrating? <laughs> the five, the five um, Rabbanim that got Sabiha from Rabbi Akiva after all those 24,000 oh, died. So let's, let's understand who was Rabbi Akiva and then we can appreciate what we lost and appreciate what we're celebrating. Right. We can, I have a book in my car by a rabbi called Marcus Lehman, German rabbi from the 1800s. He has a book called Akiva. Fascinating. You don't even realize he fit in like a hundred different Gemaras in there. He doesn't like quote the Gemara. He just read it as a story. And then he has, I guess you would call it the female version, called his wife, was, her name was Rachel. Yeah. Her name was Rachel. Yeah, yeah Baruch Hashem. So, it's good. Her, her name was Rachel. So highly recommend it. So, we take ourselves back little, almost 2,000 years. The walls of Yerushalayim are surrounded. And there's three very wealthy men in Yerushalayim that have enough resources to wait out the Romans. We have enough resources for 21 years. Fruits, vegetables, wood, everything will be good for 21 years. And there's no way the Romans are going to stay surrounding Yerushalayim for 21 years. A year, two years, three years. They give up hope. They realize these people, they try they're not, they can't besiege the walls. Excuse me, there's a group of people called the Baryonim. And the Baryonim, maybe from the term like barbarians, they, they want to fight the Romans. And everyone says to them, there's no way. There's no way we'll be able to defeat the Romans. Our army is not strong enough. Let's just stay here and wait them out. The head of the Baryonim is the nephew, if I'm not mistaken, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai, who is the chief rabbi. They're ready to fight. He has a meeting with Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai, Rabbi Yochanan convinces him, not, he says, even if I wanted to stop them, they're just, they're gun ho they're adamant, they're passionate, and they just, what do these people do? They realize that the Jewish people aren't willing to even try. So they go and they burn all the resources. The Jewish body won't even burn the, re- now the Jews are stuck. Chief Rabbi Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai says, we need to figure out a way to, to do whatever we can. Rumor goes out that the chief rabbi died, they take Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai, they put him in a coffin, and two students bring him out. Out of respect for the rabbi, the Romans say, no problem. They let him out to be buried. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai comes to where the Romans were camped, and camped, and he says, I'm the chief rabbi of the Jewish people, I need to speak to the general. He goes to the general. Who was the general? So it was his father. His father was Vespasian, and he comes and he says to Vespasian, greetings to you, my dear emperor. Vespasian takes out a sword and says, if the emperor heard that, he, he would kill me and kill you. He says, and he quotes a pasuk in the Navi, the prophecy is, the hands of Jerusalem will only be given to the emperor. As they're talking, comes riding on two horses, come two people, and they say, hail the emperor, the emperor in Rome has just died, and the council has voted you, General Vespasian, as the new emperor. We need you to come with us. He says, okay, I'll leave my son, Titus, Titus, to finish the job here in Jerusalem, and he's going to go back to Rome. He says to Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai, because you were the one to give me good news. The Gemara goes through not our class for now. Interesting, it says when he, 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 he was supposed to take off his shoes, to I guess switch shoes or whatever it was, and he wasn't able to. Because, and Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai said, when you hear good news, your, your feet swell. Your body swells a little bit. You might call it bloated, whatever you want to call it. When you hear bad news, it, it goes back. So he said, if you want to be able to switch, hear bad news. Either way, he says to Rabbi Yochanan, I'll grant you three requests, because you're the one who gave me the good news. I'll grant you three requests. 
And one of them was, Give me the city of Yavne and the, the rabbis over there, the wise people over there. And we have Torah because Rabbi Yochanan, he, he made sure that Vespasian wouldn't destroy the city of Yavne. You might have heard of the yeshiva. Karen B. Yavne, there's a school in London. Okay, Yavne College, right? It became great because of the story of Rabbi Yochanan. Ten the Yavne v'chachameh. The commentary says, why didn't he just say, don't destroy the Beit HaMikdash? That would have been a much better request than the rabbis in Yavne. He said, Rabbi Yochanan understood it was a done deal. In Shamayim, it was already destroyed. It happened to me down here. They didn't actually put fire. The fact that the stones burn is a miracle. It just doesn't make any sense in the first place. But okay. One of these three wealthy men is a man called Kalba Sabua. You ever heard of Kalba Sabua? What does Kalb mean? Kalb is the Aramaic word, way of saying dog. And Sabua means full, satiated. People would come starving. Right? Anybody who has kids knows kids are never hungry. They're starving. <laughs> Mommy, I'm starving. Right? Kids, kids are never just hungry. They'd come literally starving like a dog. And Savua, you'd walk out full and satiated. Kalba Savua bribes his way out of Yerushalayim before they destroy Jerusalem and they plow it like a field. And he goes to the upper Galil. Now, this is a wealthy man. He had lots of fields. And he said, I'm looking for someone to run my fields. His friend Horkinus. And Rabbi Dezer ben Horkinus. Horkinus was a wealthy man. And he said, oh, I used to have this guy who worked for me called Akiva. Not religious, but he's a good, honest man. I think he'd be good to run your, your plantation, your fields, your business. He interviews Akiva. And he sees he's a good man. He says, you know how to run this, do that, everything. Yes. Do you know how to take off Turuma and Ma'aser? He says, no, I, I'm not learned. I don't believe in any of that stuff. Where do you come from? Oh, Yosef was my father. My grandfather, I think, was Yoshua. He was a convert. We come from the family of Sisra. Right? Heard of Sisra, the great general? Right? In the times of the Navi, he, Rabbi Akiva, his grandfather, was a convert. They came from this lineage of Sisra, the king. Royalty. He says, I, I don't believe any of that stuff. When he becomes Rabbi Akiva, he tells the students, I hated the rabbis so much, I wanted to bite them like a donkey. And the rabbis say, don't you mean... The students say, don't you mean bite him like a dog? He says, no, because a dog bites and lets go. A, bunky, a donkey bites and doesn't let go until it crushes all the bones. That's how much I hated the rabbis. <laughs> he says, I don't believe any of that stuff. Get someone else to do the Truman Maser to take off the, the tithes. Okay. Kalba Savua has a, a, one child, a daughter named Rachel. And she was a very, very good girl, very clever girl. And she was looking to get married. And all the different people that her father would bring to her, very religious men, weren't good enough for her. She sees Akiva, and he seems like a good guy, and she starts talking to him. And they start having philosophical debates. And Akiva was quite perplexed, quite interested. He would ask certain questions, some she had the answer to, some she said, I don't know. Speak to the rabbis. I, I don't know why it is that we must do that or not allow that, etc. And after a few months, I think it was, she said to Akiva, she's a young girl, back in the day, girls get married, 12, 13, 15, yeah, I see you're a very clever man, you're a very sincere, good man, she saw his midot, and she said, if you dedicate your life to Torah, I'll marry you, Akiva says, not interested, <laughs> billionaire daughter, beautiful young woman, not interested, I don't want to, religious things, not for me, they continuously have these philosophical discussions and debates, and at one point, Akiva thinks to himself, even if I wanted to, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. What was life expectancy back in the day? <laughs> 45, 50, 55. I remember one time hearing a story, this guy was traveling in like the Himalayan mountains or wherever it was, and he sees this African guy. And the guy is a young guy, 25 years old. The guy says, I'm having a midlife crisis. He says, midlife crisis, you're 25. In my country, life expectancy, 50. <laughs> People didn't live that long back in the day. Akiva says, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Okay. One day he's walking, says the Gemara, and he sees this massive boulder. In the middle of the boulder was a huge hole. He looks down, it goes all the way to the bottom. He's fascinated. Because if you took a hammer and you started banging, you'd, be wasted, you'd break the hammer. How, how did you get there? They didn't have dynamite. How did you get this hole? And he realizes that there's a little drip, drip, drip. 
And eventually over time and over years, that little drip that's nothing can cause a hole. And he says, if that little drip could penetrate this boulder, then maybe the Torah can penetrate me. Comes back to Rachel and says, I'm in. She's ecstatic. She says, amazing. She goes to her father, daddy, I have a chatan. He knows she's very picky. She only wants the best. Amazing. Who's the guy? Akiva. Akiva who? Akiva, the worker guy. He's not religious at all. He's 40 years old. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't know any, doesn't know Aleph bit. I'm telling you, daddy, he gave me his word, he's going to dedicate his life towards Torah. He says, he just wants to take advantage. You're a young, beautiful girl. He's very wealthy. You're going to see. He'll agree to whatever you want. And then, <laughs> he's not going to do it. It's going to be too late. He says, no, daddy, I, made, I gave him my word. I'm going to keep my word. You're going to see. He's going to become a great person. Kalba Savua says, I have one child. You're my only child. I make a ned there. I swear that if you marry this guy, I'm excommunicating you. You're in Cherem. I want to have nothing to do with you. Sorry, why did she want to marry him in the first place? She saw, she saw potential. the potential. Right. She saw his potential. Not easy, but she saw his potential. She saw his midot, the Gemara says. His character traits. She says, I don't care, daddy. I'm marrying him. He says, if I cut you off, and he's busy learning Torah all day. How are you going to manage? It's not like a, in those days a girl could go get a job. She says, I'll sell my hair. Right? Not such steady work. But I guess back in the day they also had, you know, <laughs> shaitos and wigs and whatever it was. I'll sell my hair. Yeah, there's a market for it. He says, I'm, not, I'm cutting you off if you marry this man. She says, I don't care. And she marries Akiva. He goes to learn Aleph bit. Now, even until a couple hundred years ago, the average person didn't learn how to read. Only the upper echelon of society knew how to read. They kept it that way because they wanted to make sure there was... <laughs> so I guess it was like that amongst the Jewish people because our rabbis tell us, Akiva, Amen, doesn't even know Aleph bit. Now it could be he knew basics. Right. Aleph, you take the letter Aleph. Right. So you have over here the letter Aleph. Aleph is Aleph, but it's also 26. How is Aleph 26? Right. Aleph has a numerical value of 1, but also 26. How is Aleph 26? Because if you look on top, there's a little Yud. You look on bottom, there's a little Yud. And there's a line going through it, that's a letter Vav. Yud Yud, yud, yud and Vav is 10, 10, and 6, 26, representing Shem Hashem. It could be, that, that's a very simple, basic. <laughs> maybe, maybe they were going through all the depths of what's the letter Aleph, what's the letter Bet. But it sounds like he was sitting, studying with even the kids in Cheder. Aleph A, Aleph E, Aleph O. Right? Pretty embarrassing. Rabbi Akiva didn't care. Rabbi Akiva, he's sitting there learning Aleph Bet. And slowly but surely, he starts learning a bit more. And he must have been very clever. More and more and more and more. But they had nothing. They had nothing. Right? They have a child. And before, they, they, they learned to feed him. The Gemara tells the story. One day, Akiva and Rachel, there's a knock at the door. And this poor man says, maybe, 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 please, you can help me. And they're like, are you kidding me? <laughs> we have nothing, literally nothing. He said, maybe my wife's due to have a baby. Maybe just some straw for her to lie down. Just some hay. And they said, hey, we can give you. And they gave him some hay and they closed the door. And Akiva says, you see, we thought we had it really bad. There's people that are even struggling more than us. More than us. It gave them chizuk. Our rabbis tell us, who is that poor person who came to visit Akiva and Rachel? Eliyahu Navi. Well, why didn't they just, Eliyahu Navi, give him some money. Here, Eliyahu Navi. That's not what he needed at that time. He needed the chizuk. And he, he said to her, I promise you, some type of thing in those days, that wealthy people, they got the keter shel Yerushalayim, a golden crown of Yerushalayim, whatever that means. He said, I promise you that one day I'll get you one of those. Okay. Akiva goes to learn. One of his rabbis is Nachum Ish Gamzu. You heard of Nachum Ish Gamzu? Nachum Ish Gamzu was called Nachum Ish Gamzu because no matter what happened, he always said, Gamzu Litova. Remember when I was studying in Israel, so a friend of mine calls me up. He says, Mo, what are you doing for Shabbos? I'm like, I don't know. He says, you want to go to Tzfat? It was like 11 o'clock. I'm like, when's the last bus? He's like 12 o'clock. I said, where are we going to eat? He said, I have no idea. So said, where are we going to sleep? He said, I have no idea. I said, in. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Right? <laughs> Another story for another time, but Baruch Hashem, it was very nice. And on the bus, you know, we, we, I remember running for the bus, we just caught the bus, on the bus we saw some guys from the mirror, 
And then we bumped into them in Tzva during Shabbat. I'm like, where'd you eat? This, that, whatever it is. And they said it was the weirdest thing. We ate by this guy, and he said, you ever heard of Nachamish Gamzu? They're like, yeah. He said, you want to go to his kever? And they're like, you're not really supposed to go to Kfarim on Shabbat. It's a little bit weird. So then no, no, come with me. He opens his back door. Nachum Ish Gamzu is buried in this guy's backyard. I'm like, seriously? It's like, hey, in Tzva. It's like, <laughs> I also think it's creepy. But <laughs> this is a Tana, you know what I mean? Okay. Nachum Ish Gamzu, no matter what the situation was, he always saw the positive. The famous story is that there was a new Caesar. If you go through Roman history, there's many, many a times that every couple of years they went through a different, different king, a different Caesar. And each one, you want to be a fan of the Jews. So they used to go and give gifts, i.e. a bribe. And there was a new Caesar who they heard wasn't a fan of the Jews. So they got together loads of gold and silver and diamonds. And they said, who's going to be the one to present it to the king? And they chose Nachum Ish Gamzu. Nachum Ish Gamzu is traveling. He stops in a hotel. And he says to the innkeeper, can you hold on to my, my uh, chest? No problem. They go to sleep. The innkeeper opens up the chest. It's full of gold, silver, diamonds. And he takes it all. But he realizes they're going to pick it up. It's going to be light. So what does he do? Says the Gemara, he fills it with sand. Nachum Ish Gamzu, before he leaves, opens up. And what does he see inside? It's full of sand. And his students say, what are we going to do? He says, Gamzu with Tova. This is also for the good. How could it be good? It's all meant to be. They go to the king and they present to him the chest. He opens it up. He says, not only did you not bring me a gift like all other nationalities, but you have the audacity to bring me dirt. We're going to kill them all. Somebody comes over. The story of Marcus Lehman says it was a guy called Flavius Clemens, which we don't have time to go through properly, but he ends up saving the Jews. He gives his own life to save the Jews. You see many stories of the Chachamim and the Gemara on boats. Why were they often on boats? Because they were traveling to Rome to go plead on behalf of the Jews or to go bribe, give gifts to the new kings. Many times the Akiva is on the boat and the Chachamim. There's a lot of halachot about Shabbat, boats, yes, no, did it dock, did it not dock? Are you able to? It's all because they were traveling so often to Rome. Nachum Ish Gamzu. So this guy leans over and says to the king, Your Highness, the Jews aren't stupid. It must be, this is the special sand that legend has it that Abraham, Abraham Avinu, with Eliezer, they went and they fought and they threw the sand and it turned into spears and arrows. He says, you know what? There's a certain area we want to conquer. They've been holding out. We'll go, we'll try. They take the dirt, turns into all these sands and spears and they win the war and now the king is ecstatic with the Jews and Nahum Ish Gamzul, you see, I told you everything's for the best. He always saw the positive. Rabbi Akiva, learned from his rabbi Nahum Ish Gamzu, no matter the situation, he always saw the positive. Well, fast forward many years, Rabbi Akiva thinks that there's a man called Bar Kochva he says, this man is Mashiach. This man's Mashiach. He was convinced Bar Kochva is Mashiach. And at one point, Bar Kochva says, we need to make an alliance with the Egyptians to defeat the Romans. Rabbi Akiva says, if you are the Mashiach, you know that it's Hashem that's going to save us. Bar Kochva says, yeah, but we have to do Hishtadut. He says, Mashiach would know Hishtadut is not partnering with the Egyptians. Right. They go back and forth. Bar Kochva says, I have responsibility to the people. Maybe I'm not Mashiach, but I got to do what I think is the right thing to save my soldiers. Rabbi Akiva leaves him. As Rabbi Akiva is traveling, he stops by a hotel. They didn't have Gedolim cards back in the day. They didn't know who it was. He's with a few students. He says, do you have any room in the hotel? They say, sorry, no, no room. The students say, what are we going to do? Kol David Achmanah Tav Whatever God does is for the best. They go sleep in the forest. They have a fire. They have a donkey. They have a rooster. Comes a lion and eats the donkey. That's not a normal thing. What are we gonna, how are we going to travel? Whatever Hashem wants is meant to be. The rooster drops dead. What are we going to do? Whatever Hashem wants is meant to be. The fire, massive wind out of nowhere comes out, puts out the fire. <laughs> we're freezing cold. Whatever Hashem wants. The Gemara continues. The Romans were coming to fight Bar Kochva. On their way, they went to the hotel, they killed everybody. Rabbi Akiva says, you see, if we would have been there, we got to got killed. They would have heard the donkey braying. They would have heard the rooster in the morning. They would have seen the fire. Everything that happened is for good. Rabbi Akiva always sees the good. Rabbi Akiva goes to study in yeshiva 12 years. After 12 years, he comes back to visit his wife. He's about to walk in. And he hears his wife 
talking to the neighbor. And she says, I can't believe you haven't seen your husband in 12 years. He's not even going to recognize you. He's not going to recognize the kids. And she says, if it was up to me, it would stay another 12 years. What does Rabbi Akiva do? He turns around and goes home. And the commentary say, I don't understand. You're at the door. You haven't seen your wife in 12 years. Sit down for a tea. Say hello. They said, Rabbi Akiva understood 12 plus 12 doesn't equal 24. 12 plus 12, what does that mean? 12 plus 12 doesn't equal 24. You take a pot, you put in some water, you put some eggs, you want to make them hard boiled. You put it on the fire five minutes, you take it off. You have hard boiled eggs? No. Ten minutes later, you put it back on the fire for another five minutes, take it off. Still not hard boiled. An hour later, you put it on the fire for another five minutes. Two hours later, another five minutes. It might have been on the fire overall for over an hour. Do you have hard boiled eggs? No. Because 5 plus 5 plus 5 doesn't equal 20. <laughs> Rabbi Akiva understood 12 plus 12 is not 24. Next week's parasha discusses the curses for the Jewish people. And it says 10 people will chase 100. And 100 will chase 10,000. And the commentary said the math doesn't work. <laughs> it should be 100 will chase 1,000. If one chases 10. They say no. Because when it comes to these things, it's not about the numbers. And there's a rabbi called the Me'iri. He says same thing with learning Torah. You have Moshe Levi. Now let's say Moshe Levi learns an hour of Torah a day, and you have uh, Chacham Ovadia. Chacham Ovadia learns 20 hours a day. Technically, how much more Torah should Chacham Ovadia know than Moshe Levi? 20 times more. Meanwhile, he knows like a billion times more. Why? So the Meiri explains, when you learn an hour nonstop, no toilet breaks, no phone, no WhatsApp, you, you get credit for an hour. You learn two hours, nonstop, no distress. You get Siata Deshmaya, as if you learn four hours. You learn three hours, non-stop, head down in the Talmud. It's as if you learned 16 hours. And he does the math. If someone sits for eight hours straight, it's not easy. Non-stop, focused. It's as if they learned for 256 hours. That's why the Gidolim know thousands and thousands or millions of times more than, than nobody Moshe Levi. Because they just non-stop. Three hours, five hours, eight hours. So they, they get, Rabbi Akiva understood 12 plus 12 is not 24. It's exponentially more. So he didn't stop. He didn't take a break. And after 24 years, he comes home with 24,000 students. By now, he's the Gadol Hador. And his wife wants to say hello. I think it's uh, justified and warranted. <laughs> she hasn't seen him. But so do thousands of people. Gadol Hador. And they're not letting anybody through. Rabbi Akiva sees Rachel and he says famous words. Sheli v'shelachem shelahi. What's mine and what's yours to all his students? Shelahi is hers. All the Torah that we have in Shamayim, <laughs> it's all hers. That's true. When you women send your husbands to go learn and, and the kids to the yeshiva, it <laughs> doesn't matter. I, you I, get I, credit. <laughs> Doesn't, you get credit. I heard a shit from Rabbi Mansur. He said the women get a lot more credit than the men. Why? A wife sends her husband to learn for an hour. She's busy. She's shopping with the kids. How much credit does she get? An hour. The guy goes till he finds parking. <laughs> makes himself a coffee. Someone says to him, Oh, you saw this You saw this meme I just got? Oh, it's such a hysterical meme. Yeah? Someone showed me a meme. He's like, Rabbi, check this out. Alexa, Shabbos mode. Alexa, it's dark in here. <laughs> can't say it, but you can hint it. But one, of my, one of my favorite memes is like, I don't understand vegetarians. If they love animals so much, why do they keep eating all their food? The guy he should have been learning. He sat down, he learned 40 minutes, 45 minutes. How much credit does he get? 40 minutes. How much credit do you get? An hour. So the women are getting more credit than the men. Everything that I am and that I have, it's all hers. Not just me. Everything. So you send your husband to learn Torah and then he teaches others. He gets others and inspired your kid. You're getting all that credit. Now all the great men, Rabbanim, wealthy men, they come to meet Rabbi Akiva. What time do we have? Until 10 o'clock? Sorry, 11 o'clock? Five more minutes? Yeah, we'll do it quickly. All the great people come, including Kalba Sabuah. And... He doesn't recognize Rabbi Akiva. <laughs> he has no idea. In a billion years, it never would have entered his mind that this... So, what's your name? Kaba Sabu? Okay. Um, do you have any children? 
He says, well, actually, sort of. What do you mean, sort of? I have one daughter. I haven't spoken to her in over 20 years. Why not? He says, you understand. You're a rabbi. She married this Amma Aretz, this man who doesn't even know Aleph is not religious at all. He says, what if I told you that this man would grow up to learn Torah? Kabbalah was, if I knew that he was going to learn one Mishnah, I never would have made that promise. What if I ever told you he's going to learn to grow up to be a, a rabbi? Rabbi? Uh, what if I told you, I, I would take away the nether, I would, I would do atarat nedarim, I would, uh, of course. He says, <laughs> that's me. He says, it can't be. He says, I'm Akiva. It never entered his mind. It'd be Akiva, it's the same Akiva that married his, in a million years. It can't be. They do atarat nedarim, and now it'll be Akiva becomes a wealthy man. Long story short, Unfortunately, the students of Biyah Akiva start, start dying. The Biyah Akiva, the Gemara says, going hundreds of funerals, 12,000 pairs, tens of thousands of, orphan, of widows, hundreds of thousands of orphans. The Biyah Akiva, as wealthy as he was, he needed more money. He finds this very wealthy woman whose husband had passed away, and he makes a deal. I think it was 10,000 gold coins. He makes a promise. One year, I need this money to be able to support all these orphans and widows. I guarantee the money back into, within a year. The Biakiva goes and he's borrowing and borrowing and borrowing and borrowing, raising money. The year comes and he's not feeling well, he's not able to travel. Once again, long story short, there was somebody who was going to visit the king to give the king a gift. And their boat sank and the tr- this chest, instead of sinking, floated to, on the beach. <laughs> this woman had a beach, beach house. And she said, Akiva didn't come to pay his debt. He said to her, when they made the deal, if I don't pay you, Hashem will pay you. I needed a guarantor. Nobody's going to guarantee for 10,000 gold coins. <laughs> Trillions of dollars, billions of dollars. He says, Hashem will be my guarantor. She says, no problem. That treasure chest on the day Akiva, be Akiva couldn't travel, comes to her, she opens it up, she counts it, exactly 10,000 gold coins. She says, Akiva, your guarantor paid. You couldn't pay, your guarantor paid. A few weeks later, Rabbi Akiva comes with the money. She says, no, I'm not taking it. <laughs> I already got paid. <laughs> you didn't pay me, your guarantor did. Rabbi Akiva had the money to help these poor people. Rabbi Akiva has a yeshiva with 24,000 students. He's giving shiur in coliseums. And then like this, within a couple of weeks, everything collapses. Imagine you open a business and it's going amazing and you put Amazon to shame. And it's not worth billions, it's worth trillions. And it's a super, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of workers. And then unfortunately, pretty much overnight, the economy collapses, you lose everything. You're 100 years old. You're going to start a new business? No. You can't even get out of bed. In 2009, I was walking my father-in-law in Deal, New Jersey. And he points to the house and says, you know this guy? I said, no. He says, oh, you know his brother? He tells me the name. Says he lost everything when the housing market collapsed. Thirty million dollars. Says he was so depressed and so embarrassed, he didn't leave his house for a year. They came to him to read the Megillah to build the Shabbat. He wouldn't, he wouldn't leave his house. Rabbi Akiva, greatest rabbi, and no one else is dying except for his students, and they're probably like Akiva. You know, must be something's off over there. He must not really be a great rabbi if only his students are dying. And he doesn't say, I'm 100 years old. It's not meant to be. Hashem obviously doesn't want me to have Yeshua. He always saw the positive, Rabbi Akiva. He always saw the good. There's a few more stories we don't have time for now, maybe a different time. Rabbi Akiva always saw the positive. He kept going. He, kept, he, he goes down south and he takes five new students. The greatest of the five is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. By the way, I was thinking about it. If it's me, Rabbi Akiva just lost 24,000 students. And you have all these widows and orphans, and they come to me and say, um, Rabbi Akiva starting a new yeshiva is looking for some students. They never come to me because I'm nobody. But let's say, right? Um, you want to join Rabbi Akiva's yeshiva? The one who all his students just died? <laughs> I don't think my wife and kids will be very happy. Um, uh, Rabban Gamliel, I heard, has a yeshiva. Like, are you kidding me? No. Rabbi Akiva perseveres. He goes. He takes five new students. And instead of having a coliseum, he has literally four or five people around the table. And he give each one a portion of Torah. And because of that, we have Torah today. 
what are we celebrating? We're celebrating the perseverance of Rabbi Akiva. The greatest. And Rabbi Shimon uh, Yochai in his own right was in a cave for 13 years, learning Torah all day, you know, didn't have any clothes, the sand up to his neck, different quests for a different time. We're celebrating that Rabbi Akiva always saw the good. The farmer who doesn't ask, how are you going to manage? At least this guy got three times as much. We don't ask questions. Hashem says, I trust. But, but how? That's not my business. <laughs> it'll be what it'll be. Whatever's meant to be. People are like, oh, what's your view on, uh, on aliens? Do they exist? And I'm like, hmm. when they show up, I'll worry about it. Otherwise, it's really irrelevant. Makes for some good movies. <laughs> Who cares? What happened with the dinosaurs? I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't affect my life. So what do I worry about? It, things you can't control, don't worry about it. It is what it is. I did my hashtag, dude. I sent the email. I sent the, uh, called this one. I sent that one. Whatever Hashem wants is what's going to be. The farmer, he says, Hashem said, don't touch your land. I won't touch my land. Rabbi Akiva said, this is what happened. Whatever it is, I'm going to do what I got to do. Whatever happens, the results, that's up to Hashem. Rabbi Akiva kept going. He always saw the positive. And especially after the past couple of years we've had, we have to have that attitude. What was, what could have been, what should have been, it, it's done. I mean, I'm, I'm dyslexic, so I retain stuff much better audio. Right. Wherever I go, I take my AirPods, listen to Shiurim, and I was listening to a book. And I said to my, I sent it to my brother-in-law. And the book was The Power of Now. It says most people live in regret and with anxiety. They live in regret over, I should have bought this house, and I should have invested in crypto before it collapsed, and I should have done, and if I only would have told her this, and if I wouldn't have said, they live in regret over what they should have. And they live in anxiety of what will. Well, I don't know what's going to be. If my kids, are they going to get shiduchim? Are they going to be, blah, my husband, his job, I don't know. Can you control it? So what are you worried about? <laughs> live in the now. Great people live in the now. Yeah? Don't live with regret and don't live with anxiety. Do what you can and it's going to be what it's going to be. There's no point. Rabbi Akiva said, what was, was. I don't know. It is. I got to do my hishtadu. And maybe he had the world, if you will, 24,000 students. He lost it all. Doesn't matter. I did what I had to do. I'm going to try it. And because of that attitude of always seeing the good that he learned from his Rebbe, Nachum Gamzu, no matter what happens, he saw the positive. This one, animals dying, the fire goes, it's all from Hashem, whatever's meant to be. Call the Avid Rachmana, the Tal Avid. Whatever Hashem does is for the best. If we have that attitude, we learn from Rabbi Akiva, and we can continue going. Bezat Hashem.